Well, hey, good morning, everybody. So glad that you're joining us. This is either our fifth or sixth week having online church. And so if you're sticking with us and still jumping in each and every week, kudos to you. We're so glad and honored that you would choose to spend your Sunday morning experience with us as we study God's Word together. As we jump into things, I do have a few announcements that I want to share with you. First, don't forget about online giving, safe, secure, and easy. You can find that link on our website. Number two, kind of moving forward and and every week of quarantine from here on out, and we're not sure how long this is all going to last for sure, but we're going to have two services moving forward. We're going to have a 9 and a 1030 service. You can join us for either one. I know we've got different Sunday school classes and groups that are meeting at different times via Zoom, and uh, so we're just trying to accommodate everybody and everything, and then even whenever we start meeting again, um, even though it's not September, and this is when we're going to launch our two services, we've been kind of processing through and praying about maybe having two services when we start meeting live again to kind of space out the room a little bit and give a little bit of extra distance so that people aren't crammed in and jam-packed so closely together. But we'll let you know that as we get closer to kind of relaunching and reopening the doors. But then the third announcement is that today at 11 a.m., our Sunday school class and our Kids Zone ministry, they're going to do kind of a get-together and a teaching time via Zoom. So if you have questions about that or are wondering, we posted it earlier in the week, but you can um, message the church office or message our Facebook page, um, and we can kind of give you the information that you need to have your kids be able to hang out and connect. This is kind of a, a weird time for everybody, and we're just trying to make sure that, that all people have the chance to connect and still feel that sense of community and that sense of belonging as well. But once again, I'm so glad that you're joining us today. We're launching a brand new teaching series. It's called It's Not About Me. It's going to be a study from Romans chapter 12 through 14. And the idea of it's not about me is not a very popular idea in our culture because we often make everything about us. In fact, when you think about the way that, that we post to social media and how obsessed we are oftentimes with how many comments and likes we get on different things, whether that be a selfie or what we were able to accomplish on a particular day. In fact, you think about the way that we interact with people on a day-to-day basis. We oftentimes make everything about us. In fact, whenever we go throughout our day, we kind of walk around with a mirror. That's the way I think of it. And, and you think of like an object lesson. We walk around with a mirror, and as we're having different conversations with people, we're holding up that mirror. And as they're talking and as they're making statements or as they're telling a story, the whole time we're thinking is, I wonder how I look. Or I wonder how I sound. Or how can I make this conversation get turned around so that it's once again about me. And so even though we're in a conversation with somebody else, we're really just thinking how we can make it about us. And we'll throw in little comments and we'll make little um, little remarks about how uh, we've been trying a new diet and we've been working out and we just lost 10 pounds or, or we just got this, this thing accomplished or whatever because we want people to go, oh my goodness, I didn't, I thought you lost weight. I didn't want to say anything, but it looks, you look, you look pretty good. Oh, you know, thank you very much, whatever it is. But it's like it's always us, us, us. And let me just tell you, That this is natural for us to do, and you probably do this without realizing it, and we've got to break that cycle. Like, we got to break the mirror because it's anti Christian, it's anti biblical, it's anti Jesus movement. He doesn't want us to walk around with a mirror. Jesus wants us to walk around with a towel because he doesn't call us to make our lives all about us, he calls us to serve other people. We serve a risen Lord and Savior who was a foot washer, who made everything and every aspect about his entire life about other people. In fact, this towel here I got when I graduated from seminary. Whenever you get your diploma, you also get a towel because, you know, the university wants ministers to remember that now that you have this advanced Bible knowledge, Like, you're not supposed to tout that or try to make yourself appear smarter than other people or what you really are. Now, you've got this learning and you've been given this degree so that you can be a better servant of God's people. And so I think that not only do ministers and pastors need to be reminded to be a servant and to think of others first, I think that's a challenge 
for all Christians as well. We all need to be reminded that it's not about me, or it's not about us. Now, if you're wondering, well, what is it that's not about me that I'm making about me? And this answer may surprise you, but your life. Your life is not about you. My life is not about me. And you're like, well, if that, I mean, it's my life, if it's not about me, who is it about, and what does that even look like? Well, our life is not about us. Your life's not about you. My life's not about me. It's all about Jesus and his mission. When you think about our lives, whenever we surrender our lives over to him, it is exactly that. It is a surrender. And whenever we surrender our lives, he gets to name the terms, and he has all throughout the New Testament. That we are to deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow after him. Self-denial, self-death, saying it's not about me anymore. Jesus, I've given you my broken uh, a sinful life and I have made a trade now your life is mine and my life is yours and you've paid the penalty for my sins so we don't have any rights that we get to claim no this is about me I'm a grown man I'm going to make my own decisions I'm going to do what I want no you're not not if you've given your life to Jesus because your life isn't about you anymore it's about him and his mission and making his name known Now, that may, by chance, sound a little aggressive to you, but I'm trying to say it in an aggressive way and not exaggerate the idea, but to to really kind of hone in what the Gospels teach us and what the, the New Testament teaches us, because in our culture, we are taught to make it all about us, and Jesus says, no, it's not about you, it's about me and my mission to seek and save lost people and then help those people grow in relationship with me. Now when you think about trying to live this out, it is not easy. It is extremely, extremely difficult because it is countercultural. It is also counter like our sinful nature that we're born with. In fact, we're, we're covering Romans 12 through 14, but the first 11 chapters of Romans, um, they contain just this rich, beautiful theology. And theology, to some people, it's like, ew, it's like deep thinking and big words, and they think theology in real life, there's no connection there. But the problem is, Paul goes to this beautiful theological argument how all are sinful and all have fallen short of God's grace, and the wages of sin is death. But thanks be to God that while we were still sinners, Jesus came and died on the cross for our sins to trade our lives, and now we're no longer slaves to the flesh. But we get to live by the Spirit. I mean, that's a really bad summarization of like the first 11 chapters of the book of Romans. But the bottom line is, Paul says, now that you know these things and you can think in this Christian way, I want you to live differently. So Romans 12, 13, and 14 kind of show us how to apply some of these big, grandiose theological terms like regeneration and sanctification and justification and how it's supposed to look in our day-to-day lives and how we're supposed to treat people differently based on this new grace that we've been given. And so today, we're going to be in Romans Chapter 12, we're going to cover the first eight verses of this chapter and just kind of walk through section by section over the next four or five weeks. And Romans 12, as I mentioned to you, it begins with the first 11 chapters and there's a therefore that says, because of all this stuff, now let's live differently in addition to thinking differently. He says, Paul does, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. So we are to, in view of God's mercy, in light of God's mercy, that is to say Jesus came and died for you so you don't have to pay the penalty of sin, in light of that, in light of your love and forgiveness, Let's change the way that we live, and let's offer our bodies as a living sacrifice. Now for us, we don't sacrifice animals. We don't atone for our sins that way. But back in the day, that's exactly what would have happened. The Jews sacrificed animals at different points throughout the year as a way of removing their sin, or even oftentimes giving thanksgiving to God for the blessings 
that he had given them. So Paul's not saying that we should go kill ourselves, but we, we, we would be a living sacrifice to God, which is to say each and every day we get up, we die to ourselves. We, we surrender our will to his will, and we do our best to be obedient each and every day, each and every moment of our lives. And when we live in that obedience, he says that this is your true and proper worship. When we live in obedience to God, and we're, we try to live in a holy way and please him, this is our true and proper worship. Now here's the way I think of this, is that worship is always defined in bigger terms than just what happens on a Sunday morning or a Wednesday night worship night or whatever it is. And we think that worship is good, for instance. This is the language that people often use. Man, worship was good today. And they, often it's because they felt something, like they had an experience. And at some point during the build, when the drums start to come in, like they throw their hands up and they had a moment where they felt something, therefore, worship was good. Now, listen, I'm not anti-feelings and emotion and raising your hand and being demonstrative when you sing, as long as it's within the realm of I'm trying to serve and honor God in this moment and not put a spotlight on myself. So don't hear me say you shouldn't raise your hand in worship. You should. It's very biblical. But if you kind of constrict worship to just what happens on a Sunday morning while you sing, you have a very small view and definition of worship. Paul says anybody can have an experience. Anybody can put their hands up in a moment. True and proper worship is when we offer our bodies as a living sacrifice and live in obedience day in and day out. This is the worship, one, that identifies who is really a Jesus follower because anybody can put their hands up during a worship service. But it's much more difficult to live in day in and day out obedience to him. And so if you want to have true and proper worship, the two have to exist together. It can't just be about emotions and raising your hands up and having an experience. It has to be about figuring out how to daily die to self so that you can follow God more intentionally and with greater fervor than you did the day before. And that takes sacrifice. It takes setting aside your rights sometimes setting aside your will, your wants, your desires, and your wishes when they do not line up with God and who He is and His character. Now Paul continues on and he says, Do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. We need to no longer conform to the pattern of this world, even though we were born with a sinful nature, with a desire to please self and do what we want and make everything about us. That's the pattern that we were created out of. Romans 5 says that because of one man, death and sin entered the world, and through one man, Jesus, it is ultimately taken away. Well, you and I are all born with a sinful nature. That's the pattern we've been made after. I think of a cookie cutter. That's the cookie cutter like everybody's the same, everybody thinks the same, we all worry about us and doing what we want. So don't be like that anymore, Paul says. No longer conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed into a new pattern, into a new creation, into a new person. How? By the renewing of your mind. So the first 11 chapters of Romans, where the Apostle Paul's covering all this really deep theology and all of this deep hard to understand teaching. And when you read through Romans, it's like top three most complicated books of the Bible. When you read through Romans, you go through a paragraph, you have to read it multiple times to try to figure out what it is the Apostle Paul is saying. Well, whenever you think about trying to apply all of that to your life, that is the renewing of your mind that Paul is talking about. Like as you think about this quarantine, if you think about what you've been filling your mind with and how much you're working, how much you're home and what you're doing with your time that you're home, like how much are you binge watching? I'm not anti-binge watching, by the way. But like how much are you binge watching or what are you binge watching or you know, what are you reading versus like how much good are you putting? Like what are you feeding your mind? Do you spend time in God's Word every day? Do you spend time studying 
and meditating on Scripture? Do you spend time listening to sermons or worshiping? Like, what are you feeding your mind on a day in and day out basis? Because this is exactly what Paul is talking about and referencing. Like, if you keep filling your mind with culture and what culture thinks is right, and, and you're entertained by all the things of culture, but you've never got the God stuff in play, then your mind is not being renewed, and there is no way for you to be transformed. You're going to stay in the pattern that you were born in, the pattern that is the sinful nature that is at work within us. If you want to break that cycle and say, it's not about me, it's about following Jesus, glorifying his name, and living out his mission, then you have got to renew your mind on a day-to-day basis, and over time, you will no longer be conformed to the pattern of this world. But that doesn't happen by accident. You don't become a Jesus follower, wake up the next day and the pattern's broken. Paul is giving them a challenge. Transformed. Be transformed. God transforms you when you renew your mind and feed your mind with the things that are of him and good things and godly things. And so I want you to like just to pause for a moment if you can. If you're watching this live, you're not going to be able to pause the video. But take some time today to pause. What am I feeding my mind? How am I renewing it or making it new so that I no longer conform to the pattern of this world? Because we're trying to oftentimes like break the cycle of sin in our lives or change a certain area, but we're not renewing our mind, which means that we never are transformed and we're still the same as we've always been. If you want to break that pattern, you can do it with God's help, but it takes intentionality on your part. Now then verse 3, he begins to shift into how we're supposed to live out um, within the context of Christian community, the different gifts and abilities that God's given to us. Verse 3, he says, For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. So don't think more of yourself or more highly than yourself than you ought to. Now there's an interesting dichotomy that's here. Because one thing I notice is that oftentimes we are our own biggest critic. I know that that's true of myself. In fact, whenever I was trying to work on um, becoming a better preacher and a better communicator in my church in St. Louis, we would, walk, or we would have a Saturday night service, and that, re- that service was recorded to DVD for me, and as I would leave, I would pick up a copy, and I'd go home on Saturday night, and I would watch it to see how bad I did and what needed to get better on Sunday morning. And I would watch, and I would cringe, and I thought, oh, this is awful, and why am I always doing stuff with my hands, and why is my voice so hyped? Like, just, there's just everything that you could think of. I just was critical of myself. But at the same time, even though I'm critical of myself in moments, I'm guilty of thinking more highly than I ought to of myself. And I get really offended if you're critical of me, I could be critical of me, but you don't, have, don't, you don't get to be critical of me. You're supposed to say good things. That's why I call my grandma and my mom so much, because they only have good things to say to me and about me and my teachings and my sermons and things like that. Well, we are all guilty at some point in some area of life of thinking more highly of ourselves than we ought to. And we get offended and bothered when people don't think the same way. And then here's what happens over time. We think more highly of ourselves than we ought to, and we begin to think and want everybody to think and act and have the same gifts as we do. And if you aren't, if you don't have the strengths that I have, and you know, I don't really pay attention to my weaknesses, you know, I just kind of sweep those under the rug, but if you don't have the strengths that I have, you're not as good as me. And if you don't do things the way I would do them, you're not doing them right. I mean, think about how many fights married couples get into based on doing it the way I want you to do it versus the way you want to do it. Like, how do you put the toilet paper on the roll? My wife has got me in trouble so many times because apparently I've done it wrong for like the 13 years of marriage. I have an interesting, she she told me like, hey, remember, beards are good, mullets are bad, so make sure it goes down the front and not down the back. Well, I just, when I need to change the toilet, I just put it on. I don't really care what is the, is the toilet paper coming down on the front or the back? But no, 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 there's a right way to do it, and there's a wrong way to do it. Says who? 
The toilet paper people? They've got our country in a mess. There's a toilet paper shortage. Don't listen to them. Of all people, don't listen to them. But think how many fights you get into as a couple or as siblings get into a fire, people at work, because you're not doing it the way I want you to do it. Well, there's no right or wrong here. It's subjective. There's nothing objective about it. But if you don't do it like I want you to do it, then it's wrong. Well, this this is because you think your way is the best way. Why? Because you think you're smarter than what you really are. So whenever we try to think about having a proper perspective of ourself, we might say, well, no, I'm not guilty of this because, you know, I look at pictures of myself and I think, ooh, I'm not that, I'm not that pretty or I'm not that handsome or I'm not that attractive. Or I listen to myself talk and I think, oh, I don't like the way it sounds, so this isn't me. I just really peel back the layers here to identify and evaluate, are you thinking more highly of yourself than you should? Because having a proper understanding of who you are, how much God loves you. But then if you are good at things, it's because he's gifted you. Like all of those things need to be working together. And then in the next verse, here's what Paul says. For just as each of us has one body with many parts or many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, from one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. So a body, I mean, you got fingers, you got, you got arms, you got feet, you got toes. Like, they all form a different function. Well, if you didn't have hands, boy, you would have a hard time driving and eating different things like that. And your fingers, you know, let's say the thumb said, I don't want to be a thumb anymore. I want to be the pointer. I really like, I really like when people get mad, they point. And I only get to say, good job. I want to, I want to get at people. Well, I mean, imagine if you didn't have a thumb, how tough it would be to grab something. So all the fingers of the hands, the entire, you know, all the body parts work together to make up the body. And Paul wants us to realize that within Christ's body, which is his church, both with a capital C, but then also local congregations, God gifts individuals with different gifts for a different purpose, to serve in different ways, so that the body might be complete. Now he gives examples of some gifts, and there are four different passages which give lists of spiritual gifts. There's Romans 12 here, 1 Corinthians 12, 1 Peter 4, and Ephesians 4. They kind of give different spiritual gifts mapped out, and the thing about it is they're not, they're not all inclusive. So I don't think that these are the only spiritual gifts that are present. I think God can gift any person at any time to be able to do anything that he wants them to do. But Paul does give us examples of like, hey, here are some spiritual gifts. Here's what they look like. Now, as you read through these gifts, I want you to think, how many of these should every Christian have kind of on a base level, but then some people are given an extra dose of it so that they can be used in a special way in God's body, okay? So, it says, if your gift is prophesying, which is not um, like preaching, even though some people think of it, it's literally speaking to people on behalf of God, and I think in more of a supernatural way, because he talks about teaching here. I think teaching is unpacking God's word. Prophesying here is, you know, like, and, and we don't get, we get really weirded out and we're uncomfortable by it, but like when somebody says, I have a word from the Lord. Now, if somebody says that to me, Pastor Doug, I have a word from the Lord. I want to share it with you. I'm going to be like, okay, but I'm going to keep them at arm's length and not just because of the quarantine thing, but I'm going to keep them at arm's length and I'm going to really listen and I'm going to try to test what they have to say according to God's word. And if I'm honest with you, if you came to me and said that, I would be a little weirded out, but I do believe that God still speaks through his people today. Less than probably the days of the apostles because we have God's written word and the completeness of God's word, but I don't think that all of those gifts just miraculously or automatically go away. I think they're still present in the world, particularly where Christianity is not an established faith yet. So if, it, if your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. And if it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. And if it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. Well, when I look at these, like serving, for instance, well, we're all supposed to be servants, teaching. We are all in some capacity supposed to be teachers. Like 
to, to like, I think of my kids. You think of your kids. You may not be a teacher per se, and you may not have the spiritual gift of teaching, but you're supposed to teach your kids and train them up in the ways of the Lord. Encouragement. Like we're all supposed to be encouragers. We are all supposed to give positive feedback and reinforcement to people. We're all supposed to be givers. Like everybody's supposed to tithe as a base. We all lead in some capacity. Like you may be the low guy on the totem pole or whatever, but like there is somebody following you that you want to lead into a deeper relationship with Jesus. And then mercy. Like God is a merciful God. We're supposed to kind of echo his words and his behavior to a, to a non-Christian world, and we're supposed to look for opportunities to show mercy as well. But even though these are present in the day in, day out, you know, just Christian life, some people have been given an extra dose of serving, for instance. They just have a servant's heart, and no matter how much you try to serve, the way that they think and the way that they do things, it's just unmatched because God has given them that spirit or that spiritual gift. If it is encouragement, like I try to be encouraging, but it isn't, I don't know if it's not natural when it comes from me. My kids don't always feel the encouragement from me, whereas they really do when it's my wife. It's like, that's not my spiritual gift. I don't want to be a jerk. Like I want to be kind and give those positive words, but that is not my spiritual gift. Giving, we should all give, but some people have been given more to give, and some people are able to give more generously, even with the little that they have. Leading, kind of same way, but then there are some guys who you just look at and you think, man, that guy's a leader. Like, people follow him. And what is it that, well, it's a spiritual gift. God giving them the ability to do things that naturally they aren't always able to do. So as you look at all of these spiritual gifts, and once again, this isn't a complete list, but you've got to recognize that everybody has been given a spiritual gift once they enter a relationship with Jesus and the Holy Spirit lives inside of them. In fact, what the Bible teaches us is that God gives gifts to individuals to bless the group. Individuals are gifted so that the group can be benefited. In fact, 1 Corinthians 12, one of the other lists of spiritual gifts, it says that um, for the common good that is for the benefit of everybody, for the blessing of everybody, spiritual gifts are given. It's all for the common good. It's all for the benefit of the body. So God gifts you with spiritual gifts. And the person sitting next to you on the couch with spiritual gifts, and me, like everybody who has a relationship with Jesus, we've all been given a spiritual gift so that the body of Christ can be benefited. And so that Christ can can receive glory and honor and praise even outside of the Christian setting and even outside of Christian meetings. But there are some things that we need to remember whenever we talk about serving and using our gifts. Here's one thing we need to remember. You may not always get to do what you want. Since serving is not about you, it's about Him, don't make it about you and say, well, I'm going to serve, but it's going to be on my terms and it's going to be on my timetable. Well, that is like the opposite of the mindset and the attitude that we're supposed to have. Like you don't get to declare, well, this is how I'm going to serve and this is what I'm going to do because that is in no way a servant's heart. In fact, that's like the opposite direction of having a servant's heart and saying this is not about me. I'm going to make this about Jesus and about accomplishing his mission. In fact, there are certain things that a lot of people want to be able to do or want to have the ability to do. And I think of like the same thing is true in terms of um, like a basketball team. So my son Titus, he's out playing basketball, and, and you know, it's always kind of the same thing. It's, there's 10 seconds left on the clock, and every kid in America does this, and you're making a move. Three, two, one, there goes the shot. If you miss it, of course, you say, I was foul. I get to go to the free throw line, shoot two free throws. And if you make it, everybody cheers, and everybody's happy, because every kid grows up wanting to be like a Michael Jordan or like a Kobe Bryant. It's like we want to be the guy to take the game-winning shot. Well, you know how many teams have, like, you know, on a team, how many players fit in that category? It's usually one. And nobody practices 10 seconds left on the clock, and you just run and set a screen, and then you watch the guy hit the game-winning shot. Nobody practices that by themselves, because nobody grows up wanting to set screens. Nobody grows up saying, I want to be a good rebounder. Everybody grows up saying, I want to be a shooter. I want to be a scorer. 
And in church ministry, it's no different. There are certain things that people say, well, this is what I want to do in the church. This is what, but if your gifts don't line up and with what you want to do, then if you force your way into those areas of ministry, then you're no longer making it about Jesus. You're making it about you. And there's a truth that happens whenever we force our way into areas of ministries that we shouldn't be in. And it's that if you don't do what you are good at, the body has a missing part. So if you say, no, 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 no. I know that my spiritual gift, or I know that I'm naturally gifted with music or with teaching or whatever, but I'm going to go serve in this area because this is really what I want to do. Well, if everybody does what they want to do, nobody does what they're good at, then the things in the church are not done with excellence, which is a problem. But then also you have people that are filling positions that they shouldn't be in. So if you don't do what you're good at and what God has gifted you with, and you take somebody's job who is good, and they end up coming over here and serving, then it's, it, everything is cattywampus and all out of sorts. Like, we need to do what we're good at. And you've got to keep in mind that basketball teams, for instance, and I know I use a lot of basketball analogies, but everybody wants to be a scorer. Well, what if everybody shot every time they caught it? How good of a basketball team do you think that would be? Everybody's passionate about getting their name in the paper and scoring a lot of points. What if there's nobody trying to set screens? What if there's nobody who's going to play lockdown defense? What if there's nobody who's going to try to go and get every rebound that comes off the rim? That team's not going to get very far if you've got five guys on the court who just want to be shooters. If you don't do what you're good at, if you don't do what you're naturally wired and spiritually gifted to do, then the body's going to be lacking. The team is going to ultimately suffer as a result and so whenever you think about trying to apply this think about okay where has god gifted me what am i naturally or spiritually gifted to do and whenever you kind of find that lane then jump into an area of service because you gotta start by doing something now you gotta make something happen when you think about your life when you think about serving in the church some people aren't doing anything and that's a problem on a, on a number of levels. It's, a, it's an issue in terms of like the body hurts when a certain member becomes limp and void. You're not getting enough or as much out of your Christian experience or your community experience because you're just soaking up, soaking up, soaking up, and you're never serving. You're never emptying yourself or living the way Jesus has called you to live. And then there are big like theological implications of this as well. And so, the thing I would say, and I know that this is kind of a weird time, and, and you think, okay, well, what can I do? How can I jump in? How can I start serving? There's going to be time before that actually happens. You've got more time, though, to process and pray about it. But my challenge to you is to think and process about your life and where you can jump in. Now, you may say, listen, I don't know exactly how this all works, and, and I'm new to the Christian faith. I don't necessarily know my gifts. But what areas are needed like, where can I jump in and start serving because there's a big need? Because we've got different areas where it's like people don't want to jump in and they don't really want to be committed to these specific areas. And for a person to say, I'm willing to serve and jump in, just use me where I'm needed. That would be a great benefit to the church and great benefit to different ministries in the church. And if you want to do that, and once we come off the quarantine, once we start gathering and meeting together once again, we would love to have you jump in and partner with us as we seek partner with God to seek and save lost people and help save people grow deeper in their relationship with him. And remember, the reason that we do all of this is because we are loved by God and saved by God and covered by his grace. In fact, as we shift out of our teaching time and into our communion time away, <clears throat> I want to challenge you to get some form of bread or cracker and some form of juice. Remember the the substances themselves are not important. What's important is the opportunity that we have to remember the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. So if you could, grab the bread. And let's remember for a moment Christ's broken body, the beating that he took, and the mocking, and the weight of the world on his shoulders, and all that he had to endure for us. To give us forgiveness of sins. Let's take and eat at this time.
In the same way, we remember Christ's shed blood. And with the beating and with the nails, um, the blood of God and the blood of God-man spilled all over the ground. And just as the way it was spilled in the Old Testament as a sacrifice for sins, Jesus was the ultimate sacrifice. His blood was shilled, uh, uh, shed through great pain and great turmoil. And he did it because he loved each and every one of us. So let's drink from the cup and remember at this time his shed blood. Well, Father, we are so thankful for Jesus, for his willingness to die on our behalf. And Father, I pray that as we continue to meet, albeit apart and quarantined, that, um, that we still stay connected. We still do our best to live out your truth and your word. Um, even, even at work, if we still um, are working and interacting with people, when we have to go to the grocery store, when we post on social media, Father, help us to remember that our lives are no longer about us. They are about Jesus and fulfilling his mission. Convict our hearts in moments where we make it about us and where we act sinfully and selfishly. Through the power of your Holy Spirit, uh, speak into our hearts and our minds in those moments and give us the strength, the wisdom, and the courage to change our behavior and help us to be transformed by the renewing of our minds and to be strategic and intentional and deliberate about filling our minds with you and with goodness so that your Holy Spirit can use those words that we study, that we read, that we meditate or pray over um, to ultimately lead to our transformation. We lift all this up to you and pray blessing on Jesus' name. Amen. Well, God bless you guys. Thanks for joining us once again um, for our Sunday morning online teaching. Hope that you join us next week, either 9 or 1030. God bless.